Come like you want to. Come like you want to. Jesus, have your way. God of the breakthrough, nothing can stop you. Let your freedom ring. You're falling now. Welcome to worship here at Ebenezer, and thank you also for joining us online today for worship. At this time, uh, Carrie Wright, Director of Children's Ministries, has an important announcement. Carrie. Good morning. Uh, I just want to share that um, we have started opening the nursery and the uh, uh, children's ministries in a way that the nurses first, the um, children's church second, which is going on right now. We're hoping in a um, working with the ABS Sunday school classes to open here October 11th. But with that, as we're finding so many people are still married, right, are coming and serving, and um, we're struggling to, to have a need, we're struggling to find people to serve within these ministries. And so if you have an interest to uh, serve in this way, I'd love to talk to you, um, especially opening up here October 11th, hopefully the Sunday school classes and ABF, they kind of work together. If there's 
adult classes and adults can't take their kids in children's classes, there's going to be a struggle. So if you do have an interest in helping in any way in a rotation with serving in the children's ministry, don't hesitate to let me or the CE committee know of you that you have an interest. So we would greatly appreciate the help as we try to reopen things here at the church. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. This time, well, let's uh, spend some time in prayer. And so I invite you just to, s- to stay seated at this moment. And uh, take this moment to uh, lift to the Lord some concerns you may have, some prayer requests you may have, a time to quiet your heart, to put the distractions of the day aside so that your heart might be open for the Spirit to speak to you. So please, please pray. Lord, we thank you that we can come into your presence through Jesus, your Son. Thank you, Lord, that you are a God who cares, who hears our hearts. Lord, we have brought before you many requests, and we thank you in advance for how you will answer our prayers. We ask now, Lord, that you will quiet our hearts, that we might hear your Spirit speak. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you please stand, and we'll begin with a song. Good morning. It is so good to see you. Take a sec. I haven't seen in a little while. We are so incredibly thankful for the mercy of God. We are so humbled that he loves us so much, and his mercy is indeed more. What love could remember no wrongs we have done? Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea with a bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is would wait as we constantly
light of that, let's praise him. Let's just lift up our hearts. Let's lift up our praise. Let's lift him high and magnify the name of Jesus. Please be seated. I love this cartoon by Charles Schultz, and I love that expression by Linus. I love mankind. It's people I can't stand. And you know, I think sometimes we, we look at our life this way. If it, if it wasn't for people, 
life would be so much simpler. How many of you can agree with that? Yes. So, you know, think about relationships that you have, and uh, this is one of those times where I do not want a verbal response. I do not want you to mention anyone's name here. But think about relationships that you have, people that are present in your life. And, and boy, they can present some people problems. And here are just a few of them. Uh, you, you, in fact, as you probably know, some people like this. And again, shh, don't say any names out loud. Because if you did, someone else might say your name. So be careful. But, but just think of it. There's the person that constantly just says no. You might go to this person and say, how about we do, no. Have you ever thought, no. Do you like, no. Or you have the person who knows it all. This person knows it all. I mean, they know all about the political process. They, all know, they know all about wearing face masks. They know all about racial injustice. And they even know all about chemistry and biology. It's amazing. They know it all. They have this potential to rob us of our joy. And we have really seen this played out, I think, in the last six months, where people can very much rob us of our joy. And oftentimes, you know, people have a definite opinion on mass. People have definite opinions on race relationships. People have definite opinions about what to do at a national anthem. We are polarized and pulled apart at the seams. And people can rob us of our joy. So what are we to do? How is the church to respond? And by church, church is what? People. His people. God's people. How are we to respond? And I look at the church at Philippi. And again, I want to remind you of how the church was founded. We, we've talked a bit about that account it was on the Apostle Paul's second missionary journey where he traveled to Philippi. It was 51 A.D. And there in Philippi, Paul shares the good news of Jesus. And three unique individuals respond to the good news of Jesus in a positive way. And I think of Lydia. I think of the slave girl who was possessed by an evil spirit. I think of the Philippian jailer. Are those people all different? You know, today, if I look at, look at those people, here's, here's what I think we'd see. We would see the successful businesswoman. This woman knows how to plan. She knows how to take orders. She knows how to collect money. Then we have the girl with the tattoos that was one time possessed by the Spirit, but now is possessed by the Holy Spirit. Then we have the Philippian jailer. He's like the blue-collar worker. You know, imagine being a person who works in the prison system. Imagine that. You're always hearing good words spoken. <laughs> yeah, right. Life is going to be tough in there. So there's these three people. You think about the diversity of the, the, the people that were called to Christ. That, and, and you think about each of these people there is no way their sphere would touch into the sphere of these others. It's a diverse group of people, and their lives would only intersect because of who? Jesus Christ. It's only because of Jesus Christ that their lives would intersect. And eventually we have a pretty good basis that Lydia was the one who was, because she was a wealthy businesswoman, had a nice home, she was able to open up her home to the church. So there you have Lydia, and here the most unlikely people are coming to her house to meet for worship. You have the slave girl with the tattoos. You have the blue-collar worker, Philippian jailer, coming with his family. And the only reason, the only explanation, can you see how amazing this is? The only explanation for this is what? It's who? because of Jesus, that their lives would intersect. But now how many of you would think, would think that when it comes to, I'm not talking about major issues like doctrine, but I'm talking about minor issues in the life of the church, how many think there might be a diversity of opinions? 
you think each of these people would approach life from a different point of view? How many think that is, that's quite possible? Do you think there could possibly be some people problems in the church of Philippi? Yes, absolutely. Because of the diversity, the people who were called by Christ to form his church. Well, then we have, and I invite you to turn to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to look at Philippians chapter 4. And look at verse 2. Verse 2. So get it, once again, get a time frame. Paul goes to Philippi. It's 51 A.D. He shares Jesus, and the church is founded through three u- unique individuals. Lydia, the slave girl who was, had the evil spirit, and the Philippian jailer. Now we have Paul writing from his prison, his most likely under house arrest, chained to a Roman guard. It's 10 years later. It's 61 AD. And he writes this letter to the Philippians, to the church at Philippi. And he talks about two women there in verse 2 of Philippians chapter 4. Look at this. This is the Apostle Paul. He says, I plead with Iodia and I plead with Synthache to agree with each other in the Lord. Now here are two women that are going in opposite directions. There is some sort of disagreement that is happening among them. What I find interesting is most likely when this letter that we know as Philippians, that when this letter was originally sent to the church at Philippi, the church at Philippi most likely would have gathered at Lydia's home the church would have been gathered together. Oh, look, there's the, the slave girl who is possessed by an evil spirit. Look, there's the Philippian jailer and his family. and Plus, other people have come to know Jesus, including Yodia and Syntyche. And so the leader of the church is reading this letter to the church at Philippi. And imagine you're one of these two women and you're there, sitting there. Oh, the Apostle Paul mentions us by name. He mentions them by name. And it's not because he's like saying, commending them. He's saying, ladies, get it together. And I can just imagine Synthache saying, Yodia, notice that the Apostle Paul mentioned your name first. And of course, Yodia is saying, it's, the Apostle Paul is writing in alphabetical order. But no, no, he's, he's, he's saying, I, I plead with you to agree with each other in the Lord. And that uh, agree with each other, you could translate it literally means being of the same mind. Don't forget that, that phrase, be of the same mind. Now, we look at this, this the Apostle Paul does not address the issue. What was the issue? We don't know. But guess what? The church at Philippi, what? They knew. They knew what the issue was. They knew it. Here was this relational issue, this people problem. And Paul says to them, be of the same mind. We don't know what the issue was. The church would have known because they were living it. They were living it. But be of the same mind. Now, in many ways, our our, our churches today uh, oftentimes, in in a way, look very similar to, you know, we look very similar to one another. Probably not quite as as diverse as um, this church was. But even even in, in the midst of, you know, even churches that kind of look the same, there can be relational issues. We can still have conflict. And so the Apostle Paul is dealing with this. We, we need to remember, context is so important. We don't want to just take scriptures out of context. We have to remember that Paul is addressing an issue in the, the Philippian church, 
And that issue is relational conflict. And he is sharing God's message to this church, and he's sharing God's message to us of how to deal with relational conflict. And so we go, before we, before we look at chapter 2, we need to look again at the end of chapter 1. And we mentioned this last week. But the Apostle Paul said to the Philippian church that, Church, you are to live as citizens of God's kingdom. And this is oftentimes known, this, 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 this verses 27 through 30 is known as a hinge passage. It's a hinge passage because what came before it, verses 1 through 26, is Paul describing his situation. And Paul's situation was what? We should know this by now. He was what? He was in chains. He was under house arrest. All right? That was his situation. And he didn't know whether he was going to be what? Freed when he went to trial or whether he'd be what? Executed. He didn't know, but he knew this. To live is Christ, to die is gain. And now he's moving from his situation, and now he's going to the situation in Philippi. So this is a hinge. It's a hinge passage. It's now going to speak to the situation at Philippi. And he says here that we are to live as citizens. Verse 27, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. That is to live as citizens of the heavenly kingdom. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you can stand firm in what? One spirit contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. He wants them to be what? Unified. He wants there to be oneness. He wants to be, there to be a togetherness. Because he realizes the church of Philippi is also going to experience outside pressure. There's going to be persecution. There's already persecution happening. And they can only stand if they are united together. For divided, they will fall. And so then it goes into the next section, chapter 2. So please turn to Philippians chapter 2. And the first thing that Paul is going to do, as he talks about, we're to live as citizens of God's kingdom, of heavenly kingdom, is he's going to talk to them about their present reality. These first two verses is about the Philippian church and their present reality. And he says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ... If any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded. Now the end of that scripture is saying, be of like-minded, and it depends upon your translation that you have before you, is the same phrase used in Philippians chapter 4, verse 2, which is this, be of the same mind. He's telling the church, be of the same mind. Now, eventually, in chapter 4, he calls out two women. He calls them out and says, you need to be of the same mind. But the entire church is to be of the same mind. Why should they be of the same mind? Well, it says, all those ifs. Did you notice those ifs in that? If you want to, just even circle. And notice how many ifs are used. Now, we, in our present-day English, when we look at the word if, we oftentimes think it's conditional. In the Greek language, when you heard the word if, you're thinking of the word since. What Paul is describing is actually their reality. You can almost substitute the word if for the word since. If you have any encouragement for being united with Christ, Paul is saying, And you know you do. This is a reality in your life because of Christ. It's the reality. They have encouragement, comfort, fellowship, and tender compassion in Christ. And because of that, since that is their reality, then verse 2 starts with the word what? Then. 
since this is your present reality, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same mind, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Be of the same mind. Make my joy complete by experiencing unity within the church. This is your reality in Christ. Now live it. Make my joy complete by being one. Then Paul goes and tells us what that looks like. How can we possibly be one? How can we demonstrate it? And he tells us in verses 3 through three and 4. 3 and 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Here he tells the church at Philippi, and he's telling us, this is what you are to pursue. You're not to be selfish. You're to be humble and live in humility. You need to get your eyes off of yourself and your eyes on to others. This is how the church at Philippi can be of the same mind. When everyone is committed to this, don't be selfish, be humble, and get your eyes off of yourself and look at others. Now, think how revolutionary that is even in our culture today, which is very much what? Me, me, me. And that attitude creeps what? Into the church. We have heightened the individual, and the individual has become like a God, and the world revolves around that person. Here, we see no. Don't be selfish. Be humble. Get and your eyes on to others. And then Paul says, I want to give you the best possible example I can ever give you. And who do you think that is? Jesus himself. He's going to say, if, if you need an example of who is not selfish, who is humble, who gets their eyes off of self and their eyes onto others, Guess who it is? Well, you don't have to guess, because Paul tells us in this next portion of, of, of Philippians chapter 2. Your attitude, your attitude, your thinking, needs to start here, your attitude should be of the same as Christ Jesus. This is the mindset we're supposed to have here at the church at Philippi and speaking then to us. Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now think at this point, at this point, Jesus, God, Becomes man, becomes flesh. Jesus is the God man. He is fully God. He is fully human. And he surrenders himself, and this is, this is what we know at Advent time, Christmas time, as incarnation. God coming to us. And he humbles himself to be what? Born of the Virgin Mary. He becomes a baby. Can you imagine that? God in the flesh becomes a baby. And then he goes on to where he is the servant and he sacrifices his life on the cross. Therefore, verse 9, picking it up, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. And here we see we are to have the same attitude, verse 5, as Jesus who came as a servant, 
verses 6 and 7. Who sacrificed his life, verse 8. And then from verses 9 to 11, we see that God elevated his status. And this is the mindset we are to have. Now, this is a great scripture on the person of who Jesus Christ is. It is a great scripture. But Paul, remember, context is important. Why is Paul sharing this, these, these great, brilliant scriptures, these words about who the person of Jesus is? Paul shares it not for its theology, but for its relational ethic. The context, remember the context, there is discord in the church at Philippi. It is meant to stir them to relational harmony. And the point is, Jesus, who is God in the flesh, becomes the sacrificial servant. And if God does this, comes in the flesh, then we're to be like him. And we apply this to our relationships with one another. We are to be like him, the sacrificial servant servant to one another. When I think of Jesus being the sacrificial servant, the, the story about Jesus that really, at this point, grabs me the most is where he picked up a towel in the Gospel according to John chapter 13. Remember, again, context is important. In John 13, where, where is Jesus at? Jesus is in a rented room called the upper room. He's in the upper room. It is a rented space. This is the place that he has met with his disciples, his closest friends. His closest friends. Right before his crucifixion, which would take place on Passover. Jesus is God in the flesh. This is what this says in in chapter 2 of Philippians. He is the sacrificial servant. And here, Jesus He takes this towel, he wraps it around his waist. He takes the water basin, because everybody in the room had dirty feet. They all had dirty feet. And no one took the initiative to wash one another's feet. Only one person did. And who was that? Jesus. God in the flesh, Jesus. Who just an hour later will be crucified on the cross, and he knows it. And he humbly gets down on his hands and his knees with a water basin and washes the disciples' dirty feet. I find washing feet a little bit uncomfortable. I mean, imagine if all of a sudden I said, everybody take off your shoes and socks. We're going to wash each other's feet. How many are saying, yeah, yeah, let's... We're all saying, "Uh, I think it's time to go. I think I'm going to leave. There's something about washing feet. It's, 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 it's humbling. And Jesus gets down on his, his hands and his knees and he washes his, the disciples' feet. God in the flesh. I, I imagine this is like, this would be like the President of the United States going to some homeless neighbor, you know, finding a homeless person out on the street and getting down and washing that homeless man's feet. It would be like if they were going to have a, a foot washing in the church there at Philippi, it would, be the, it would be Lydia, the successful businesswoman, getting down on her hands and knees and washing the slave girl's feet. A position of power coming as a servant. And we're called to be servants. And so we look at that scripture again there in verses 3 and 4. Because of Jesus, this is what the Apostle Paul is saying, because of Jesus, we have this relational ethic to live by in the church. And we can ask ourselves, each one of us can ask ourselves, and it's what I've been doing all week, asking myself, how am I doing? And I love it how the Ken Taylor in the Living Bible Paraphrase puts it. Don't be selfish. Don't live to make a good impression on others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't just think about your own affairs, but be interested in others too and in what they are doing. 
You know, I can just imagine Lydia, the successful businesswoman, the slave girl who was possessed by an evil spirit at one time, the Philippian jailer, a blue-collar worker, getting together, getting together in the church. And I think, you know, God doesn't make mistakes when he puts people together in a church. And I think if you put these three together, I think the church would be unstoppable. Think Lydia. She's the planner. She knows how to create a budget. She knows what needs to be done. She's a great planner. Think of the, the slave girl that had the evil spirit, but now is possessed by the Holy Spirit. She is one, who's got, she's, she is a prayer warrior, because she knows that life is about a spiritual battle. And then you got the blue collar worker, man. He's going to pursue, pursue working at this project with all he's got, because he knows how to work. I mean, think it's great, great. God puts the people together in the church that need to be there. But you can't be so focused on your area that you forget about the others. And so for, for, for Lydia, the slave girl, and the Philippian jailer, they all had to remember that they needed to keep the main thing the main thing. They had to keep, remember what, kept, what brought them together in the first place. And what brought them together in the first place was what? Jesus himself. Jesus himself. Sacrificial servant. God in the flesh. Served. Sacrificed his life for my sin and died in my my place. First and foremost, they needed to look at Jesus. And when they look at Jesus and who he was or is and what he had done, they recognized who they were. They had to keep the main thing the main thing. Keep Christ first and foremost. And then it helps us to get our eyes off of ourselves and to think of the other person. See who Christ is, see who, what Christ did. Yes, it's unity. Unity is not uniformity. And for instance, we can't be all things to all people. We can't do everything there is to be done. And there will be times where we won't agree on what we can maybe call the small stuff. But again, we think of what? We think of Jesus. First and foremost, the sacrificial servant. All other matters become small in comparison to remembering who Christ Jesus is. So, are there people problems? Do you get along with everyone? Everything's peachy? Probably not. But here's the deal. If you're going to put this scripture into practice, here are, here are three ways, I think. When you, when, when you, meet a, when you have a person that maybe you have a differing idea, a differing perspective. Not, we're not talking about things that are major, like doctrine. We're talking about what I would call, in a sense, the small stuff compared to the doctrine and compared to Christ himself. Is, I always find it helpful to begin with prayer. In fact, is all this is what, what Jesus taught. He, he told us even to do this with people who are our enemies. And so here we're talking about we should do this even more so with people who are in the church. But when there is disagreement, we begin with prayer. And we focus upon the Lord. We break bread together, which means maybe we sit down and have a cup of coffee together. And I look at some way to bless the other person. How do I bless them? Man, today, in our culture today, it's so easy when we're in disagreement with people just to post something nasty on social media, isn't it? It's amazing. It's amazing. Instead, pray. Break bread together. Bless the other person. Bless them. Speak highly of them. Here's these two women, Yodia and Synthache. They're going in opposite directions. And Paul says, be of the same mind. Will you look to Christ first? Remember what I wrote back there in Philippians chapter 2? Think of Jesus, the sacrificial servant. Make sure you put him first. And then it begins 
to soften the relationships we have with one another. And we look for ways that we can have, that we can serve the other. And we will find out that joy, again, begins to creep back into our hearts. Don't be selfish. Don't live to make a good impression on others. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't just think about your own affairs, but be interested in others too and in what they are doing. All because of Jesus, the sacrificial servant. Let's pray. Lord, you know how easy it is for your church to get sidetracked into different issues where there's differing opinions. And Lord, you call us instead to unity. You call us, Lord, to wash one another's feet. You call us to look upon Jesus, who is God in the flesh, came and washed dirty feet and sacrificed his life for my sin. Lord, help me to get my eyes off of myself and to think about my brother and sister in Christ. And Lord, if there is someone that I need to approach this week, give me the courage to make the contact, to have fellowship together, to love the other person. Lord, might we love like you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. What a challenge to find ways to bless each other. Um, We're going to sing a really old long-standing hymn of the church. We're going to close with Make Me a Blessing. So if you would stand and join us to lift up our voices one more time today, that'd be awesome.
Be a blessing because the Lord has blessed you. Let us close in prayer. And this is our prayer, that our love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that we may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen. Please follow the usher's instructions to exit. It's a beautiful day outside. May you fellowship greatly outdoors. <laughs>